and hello everyone. Um, for those of you that haven't met me before, I'm Sue Pomeroy and um, I live just across the water, the lock from Pauline um, on the west coast in Rothshire in a place called Dundonald. I worked at Inview Gardens for 14 years as the propagator and when I left um, we have a croft which we've got our own garden in which actually I showed some pictures on in the first um, in the first series episode if you like I yep. don't know of yep. this talk <laughs> and um, actually for my sins I also I work um, now my work is actually mostly tour guiding and so I do private tours of gardens private gardens all around the whole of the highlands and actually in Ireland and any, anywhere really I'm asked to go. So with that in mind, um, I said to Pauline, it would be really nice to do a series of talks about some of the gardens I've been to. And last time I did actually up the East Coast, um, more or less to the top. And so I thought we'd just nip across the Pentland Firth, across to Orkney. And I'm rather hoping we may have some Orcadians mm -hmm, um, on this talk who are going to really actually be necessary to help me out <laughs> with some of the um, information. But I would love to hear from any of you that have been to Orkney, um, who live on Orkney. Uh, it's, it's a series, my, my, some of my favorite islands. Um, I go also out to the Western Isles as well. Not so many gardens there, but certainly Orkney has got the most amazing amount of private gardens and some public gardens too. So, with that, I'm going because I've only got an hour and I've got 43 photographs and I'm going to fling myself through them quickly. With that, I'm going to get Pauline to put up the very first picture for me. Yeah. So this is um, when when I take a group, I normally leave from Scrabster on the north coast and um, on the top right hand side of Scotland, basically uh, very near Thurso. And we catch the ferry across the Pentland Firth and uh, we end up in Stromness. And I have to show you this, this is the old man of Hoy. And I love it because if you look at the top of the rock, it's got toes. Mm -hmm. I've always wondered where the rest of him is. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, this is an amazing kind of moment when you get close in and the sea, the seabirds are wheeling around. I absolutely love this strip of water. It's really wild, amazing wildlife. And you get just really, you just feel that excitement building up because you know in about 15, 20 minutes, you're gonna be in Orkney thereabouts. So, um, so we go on to the next slide. I'm showing you a bit of an overview for any of you that have never been to Orkney. I mean, for those of you that have been lucky enough, to go to Orkney, you're going to be able to help me out, as I say, mm -hmm. and enjoy hopefully this. This is part of the Ring of um, Brogda. I couldn't fit the whole thing in in my, well, I probably could have done actually if I stood further back, but this is just absolutely beautiful. Um, in the words of some famous archeologist who I can't bring to mind, you scratch the surface of Orkney and it bleeds archeology. span mm -hmm. And anytime I go there, I invariably have to take groups to, um, Maze Howe, uh, Ring of Brogda, Stones of Stennis, and um, Tomb of the Eagles, and Scarabray, and various other places too. So I just thought I'd put this in. These stones are real, they're huge, um, much bigger than me. And it would have taken a lot of effort into putting them in. And I just think personally, that the Neolithic people who built these had a really good sense of proportion, and obviously loved gardening because obviously it is a garden, isn't it? It's not just standing stones. I would say it was a garden. So with that, on to the next one, Pauline, thank you. So these are the step, um, these, I just actually wanted to put this in because the wildflowers in Orkney are next to none. This is Bob Cotton Grass in front, which is absolutely beautiful. This is another section of the um, Ring of Brogda. I think it is actually, I'm pretty sure it is looking at that stone. I recognize the shape of it. It's not the stones of Stennis. Um, I'm hoping they're going to be next to it actually. But I just wanted to give you an idea. It's absolutely not bleak Orkney. It's very green, rich and fertile, lots of cows, amazing wildflowers. And these fantastic Neolithic standing stones, they're amazing. Mm. Um, I could give you a bit of history, but I haven't really got time. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. 
And if you've got any questions about the archaeology, I'm very happy to talk to you about that too. Yeah. So very quickly, this is actually um, quite close to the rings. This is Scarabray. This is a Neolithic village which was uncovered after a massive storm and the sand moved and they discovered this amazing uh, village. And you can see the house in the background, that's called Scale House. And the little girl that lived there at the time used to play in these buildings. Um, can you imagine this is her very own like huge doll's house to play in. Apparently she found combs and beads and things and used to play with them, make believe. My absolute perfect dream. Anyway, the, any visit to Orkney, ha, you have to go to see Scarabray. So with further, no further ado, we'll move on to the next slide, Pauline. Mm -hmm. I could do a whole talk on archeology span at some point because that's my, oh, another oh, love oh, of mine. Oh, so again, um, what we're looking at is Scale House in front of us, um, which still actually is connected to um, Scarabray. You can walk and go and see Scale House. And in fact, it's got lovely gardens of its own. It's got primulas and all sorts of amazing things. And the house inside is beautiful. You could just move in and fall asleep in the library. Mm -hmm. um, wild flowers in the front. This is actually, um, I think this is wild angelica growing in here. And the moths and the butterflies and the insects are just incredible, absolutely beautiful. So if we move on to the next photograph, please, Pauline. I'm going to go straight into gardens mm -hmm. and here we have it. And I thought this was a really appropriate photograph. Um, I've chosen three gardens to visit. There are a lot more gardens in Orkney. Um, this one is very special because this is just behind Scarabray. It's in Kirfold House and the garden belongs at the moment to um, Ewan and Fiona Smith, two lovely, lovely people. Uh, Ewan runs his own coffee business, unusual for Orkney, I know, but really good coffee. And Fiona has taken up a passion for geraniums. Now, Kierfold for many years had a kind of a national collection of geraniums and has incredibly special geraniums. And for Fiona's birthday, her husband bought her um, a microscope so she could sex geraniums. Can you imagine that? <laughs> so I thought that's just the best birthday present ever. I mentioned it to my partner, Will. I said, I want a microscope so I can sex geraniums and looked at me as if I was completely mad. <laughs> anyway, um, these geraniums, I, I would, I mean, I think there's so many of them. I couldn't actually put a name to them. I think one of them could be Kendall Clark. And this flower in the front is actually a strantia, probably Ruby Wedding. Possibly mm -hmm. it could be Roma, but I'm not entirely sure. If we move on to the next slide, Pauline. Yeah. Thank you. Now, this is actually, these are some of my um, guests that I took to their garden. And I wanted to show you this because the garden is completely enclosed by this amazingly protective wall um, with these absolutely beautiful line of sycamore at the bottom. You can just see that bushy tree, which are really, really old. But if you look beyond the wall, how flat and actually exposed it is. And in fact, you're looking down towards Scarabray down there. Mm -hmm. um, so the wind can be wild. So this garden is very, very special. It's like a secret garden. And these beautiful, big, billowy, kind of herbaceous borders, just full, absolutely full of geraniums and colour. If we go on to the next slide, please, Pauline. Again, another geranium. I had to put this in. And this is actually with an allium. Um, and a little bit of Regersia in the background. And I just really love these colors, this color combination. Um, I, again, just really, really beautiful, just kind of gives you this amazing um, atmosphere in this secluded garden. And the insects and the birds, again, completely amazing. If we nip onto the next one, Pauline. And there's the said sycamore. Now, these are really old, and Fiona did tell me how old they were, and I can't remember what she said, mm. but I would say they were easily over 100, maybe 150 to 200 year old sycamores, mm. and they get coppiced back, so they get cut down, so they stay really sturdy, and then they grow back really, really strong, 
against the winds. And the actual the branches and the leaves, um, how do you describe that? They um, filter the wind, so they don't they don't give a complete barrier, so they're not knocked over. They actually filter the wind, so it breaks it up. And so the rest of the garden is sort of protected by this the, the wall and then the sycamore trees filtering the wind mm. which works incredibly mm. well really beautiful next slide please Pauline. Yeah. <coughs> and there we have Kierfold house and this is just exactly what the garden looks like when you first see it you think oh my goodness um how do you move through that but yeah. they're tiny tiny wee little wiggly paths mm -hmm. and my advice is don't go when it's rained because you get very wet trouser legs mm -hmm. and definitely go in the summer because the flowers are absolute next to none mm -hmm. and the best part is actually um i believe i think they still might actually do this they do bed and breakfast as well and i think they've got two little chalets that they rent out mm -hmm. um but i'd have to check that but they're an absolutely lovely couple. And actually, in fact, Fiona, the other thing about Fiona is the mo she's the most amazing needlework lady. Oh. She does absolutely beautiful wall hangings with incredible stitching. And she travels throughout the country, the whole country, giving lessons and tutorials on how to do applique. Mm. I'm not entirely sure what that is, but um, she does <laughs> teach it. And um, other kinds of stitching, beautiful, amazing wall hangings and uh, sewing. So you, not only can she sex geraniums with yeah. a microscope, she can sew. <laughs> um, and as I say, Ewan actually, his, his past hobby was actually mending sewing machines, interestingly. So I think they're very well matched. And obviously his coffee is um, next to none too. Yeah. So if we go on to the next um, slide, Pauline. Yes. And I just quick close up that beautiful blush pink thing in the middle is a poppy. Yeah, it's an opium poppy mm -hmm. and um, they flower the incredible tight bud they flower and they're like beautiful bits of silk opening out and they come in various different colors they last a few days and then drop and then you've got the really lovely kind of green sappy um, poppy head that dries yeah. beautifully the yellow flowers lysomachia and the purple flower is geranium, oddly. And then I think um, we've got a polygonum of some sort, the pink flower. Mm -hmm. I think that's a polygonum as well there too. Yes, and absolutely what, what gorgeous. Month, what month would you need to go in to, go, to see the poppy then, Sue? So? Um, I would say this was probably June, June, mm -hmm. July time would be a good time to go. Yeah. Um, and actually that's our Camilla Mollus at the front there. June, July, um, any time's really nice to go and see Orkney, but definitely June, July, August, brilliant times. The poppies tend to flower on and off throughout. Oh, really? Um, and in fact, the, the other good thing about these gardens in Orkney is because it is quite breezy, uh, the midges aren't so bad. Honestly. So um, that's another thing to consider. I've never really been badly attacked by midges in Orkney actually thinking about it. So um, another good reason to go. Yes, yes. <laughs> and I think if we move on to the next photo, I'm going to just check. Right, so that was the end. This is the next garden we're going on to now. Um, yeah, great. I had real difficulty with this photograph actually because the delphiniums were so blue blue. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it, does anyone want, do you want to ask me questions about um, yeah, Ewan can, and Fiona's garden, Kierfold, before we move on or any of the other things we've seen? So Would that any, work? Anyone wants to ask a question, if they could use the um, use the reactions button to, to put their hand up or else put the hand up and I'll, and I'll come to you if you don't, if you don't, can't use that, yeah? No one got any questions at this point? No? I don't think we've got any questions, Sue. That makes it easy for Sorry, me, have, Greg. Have, Thank you. We so have. We'll go straight on to the Delphinium. Oh, hang on, hang on, Sue. We have got, we've got two questions. Oh. Sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. Well, Anne, Anne Coleman, I'm just asking you to unmute, Anne. Okay, mine was about the Delphiniums because I've never managed to grow any without the slugs absolutely raising mm -hmm. them to the ground. Mm -hmm. How do they not do that there? <laughs> that, that, you see, that is absolutely spot on. And um, I have the same problem. I have had a passion 
to grow. And in fact, um, this garden with the delphiniums is owned by Jockey Wood, Mr. and Mrs. Wood in Finstown. And when I went through the gate, again, I just couldn't believe those delphiniums. They must have been about 12 foot tall. They were wow. huge, absolutely huge. And I said, I asked Jockey at the time, I said, why, how do you manage to do that? How do you grow them so big? And why don't you get them eaten by slugs? And he just said, he doesn't, they don't seem to have the problem with the slugs in, um, on that part of Orkney. Oh. It could be because it's on raised beach. His garden is um, very shaly soil and it could be just purely that, but I was blown away by them. And um, I've been to see his garden quite a few times now. And every time I rush through the gates to the delphiniums, they're still there. No slug holes on any of the leaves. I've got a really sad one in my greenhouse, which I rescued. And it was a giant one like jockeys. And it's pathetic. It's absolutely pathetic. And what was really upsetting is a slug managed to find its way into my greenhouse. <laughs> it's eaten what's left of it. So <laughs> it's kind of insult to injury, really. Mm -hmm. So yes, I um, I put shells around mine, but it it really didn't it didn't stop the slugs particularly. Um, the other thing I might do is put bran. If you put a circle of bran around them, you know bran. If you crumble up bran, the slugs love it and they eat so much of it they actually explode oh um, and, it, <laughs> and it might actually <laughs> it might put off other slugs if they see their pals exploding on eating bran mm. so that, that's something i've got to try next um, <laughs> great but, yeah i'm with you on that one <laughs> thank you Anne. thanks for your question allison you've got a question too yeah yeah, I just was, what was the name of the house, that, the first garden you went again? It's Kierfold. It's spelt K-I-E-R-F-I-O-L-D. That's super, thanks. I'm hoping to go up to Orkney this summer again. Um, okay. The other thing, um, the, the, the Wilson's, the Woods Garden in uh, Finston, is it open to the public or is it just occasionally? Uh, the Woods Garden, his own garden, is open to the public under Scottish garden schemes. Okay. But as we go through this, there's a bit more to this than meets the eye because okay. he's got more than that garden. There's a community garden that he set up and mm -hmm. there's a drinking well as well, which anyone can go to at any time mm -hmm. of the year. Um, and actually, if you just ran, rang him, Jockey, he's mm -hmm. delightful. He would be more than happy to have you mm -hmm. around. So I think Thank probably you. by appointment, yes. Yeah. Okay, super, yes. thanks. Okay. Thank you, Alison. Okay, I think we'll, um, we'll go on to the... The said delphiniums. Yep. So, so, yeah, you can see the hedge line behind there. So this, I will just explain. This is Mr. and Mrs. Wood's garden in Finstown, um, jockey. And um, he is the most amazing gentleman and he this whole area where his garden is used to be a farm owned by his father and then his father couldn't afford to run it anymore so sadly he had to sell off bits of the field and um, build houses and Jockey and his wife live in one of the houses and have this beautiful garden but these these delphiniums are just huge in fact they could even be 15 foot tall they are just magnificent um, I should have put the photograph of Jockey standing because he looks like a midget next to them. Anyway, they're very, very big. We go on to the next photograph, Pauline. Yeah, lovely. Uh, this is um, a peony and it's called Bowl of Beauty. I think, yeah, Bowl of Beauty, that's it. And again, this is one of, in Jockey's garden and I just couldn't resist putting that in. I had to put that in um, because it is, again, Jockey's garden is surrounded by huge, huge, thick thick hedges he's got three layers of hedges to protect him from the wind because it is very flat in Finstown um and very very windy well sort of flat um and he's fairly near the sea um so his garden's really secluded and it's incredibly lush really really beautiful big blousy um herbaceous plants so that is an absolute beauty so that's a peony bowl of beauty if we go on to the next one Pauline mm -hmm. And so this is standing with our backs to his house and looking into his garden. 
Now you can see instantly around and about there's mature trees, which were probably left over from the farming days and big hedgerows with this magnificent series like an amphitheater of paths going down, his beautiful candelabra primulas, and he's got grasses, he's got shrubs in between it. Um, and I, I asked him, I say, you know, Jockey, do you actually plan this? He says, oh, no, no. He says he just kind of gets bits of plants and he just puts them in and hopes they work. <laughs> and then he says they get too big and so he splits them and moves them around. And so it's just incredible. It's like a, an absolutely beautiful tapestry. Um, and such a lovely man, such a lovely, lovely gentleman. Really, 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 really nice. Um, and yes, fantastic. I need to go back in the autumn and collect some seed, I think, actually. <laughs> I'm just eyeing up those primulas and those colours. If we go on to the next one, Pauline. Yeah, lovely. Again, a bit of a close up here. Um, so we've got the yellow ones are primula florinde, and the orange ones are also primula florinde orange um, and the pinky colored ones are primula bermanica and um, I'm just seeing if there's anything else there there's uh, yeah the, the purple ones oh I've forgotten the name I'll come back to the purple ones I should have written it down I'll come back to the purple ones they're on the tip of my tongue anyway it's uh, bermanica and florindi mainly just there so we go on to the next one, Pauline. Mm -hmm. So this is his own private garden behind his house. Now, what I'm showing you just here, um, that's my group I was with, and that's Jockey in the check shirt talking to them. What they're standing on is a road bridge going over this hollow, which is like a well, it goes down. And Jockey told me this amazing story um, when he was a boy, they used to plough the fields with horses in Orkney still. And every evening he used to take the horses down to this hollow, this dip, which was like a little stream. It's the water hole for the horses. And so when his father had to sell the farm up, um, they got to keep this bit because it was kind of in the middle of the roads, basically. And um, he planted it. He started planting it and he continued planting it. And oh my goodness, it is just magnificent. You can actually walk down into this, <clears throat> this kind of hollow and meander around this beautiful circular walk. It's absolutely beautiful and completely stuffed full of plants. Mm -hmm. Again, geraniums seem to do very well in Orkney and um, variegated iris and astrantia again there too. And in fact, there's a piece of diplorina near the wall at the back, that white iris type flowers diplorina. Um, yes, just, and in fact, further back, there's even Sambucus, beautiful big purple Sambucus, which is the elderflower um, as a backdrop. I should have put another one in with that. In fact, if we go into the next photograph, mm -hmm. Pauline, I may have put one in, I can't really remember. Uh, Actually, that is the back of it. There we have it. So this is looking in the other direction. So those people standing on the bridge would have seen this view, which is, again, uh, absolutely stooped out the beautiful primulas, the candelabra primulas. And in fact, there's a conifer, an orange type bald conifer there at the back. And um, he's got ferns and he's got, I think, a rhododendron at the back there. And he's also got pittosporum and... Um, Iliagnus, I seem to remember. Oh my goodness, there's a whole, whole, whole host of different plants. But again, it's sunk down, so it's very, very sheltered. Um, so when you're driving through Orkney, you see basically a lot of grass and a lot of cows. And if you go at the wrong time of year, they're muck spreading and it smells quite strongly. <laughs> um, I uh, have a very funny story. I took a group of people to uh, Mays Howe, which is this big burial mound in the middle of a field. And I was walking and it was actually raining and it was a pretty horrible day. And I had 25 people off a coach and we were walking up this field. And I thought, what is that awful smell? And suddenly over the top of this hill came this muck spreader and it was throwing this muck out everywhere oh. and including across the path we were about to walk on. And Thank goodness he stopped. He saw us and he had, he was very kind and he stopped. 
but unfortunately the rain and the wind carried the oh. muck and the spray and we were all clattered <laughs> and as we went into May's house the whole robin being brown uh, green it was brown absolutely oh. covered in cow dung you've never seen anything like it and then once you were inside whew, the smell was overpowering it was very they took it very well I thought actually yes. <laughs> no one passed <laughs> out anyway I digress so let's move on to the next picture this uh, one lovely so that's a quick close-up of the primula uh, romanica and florinde they have this amazing indumentum on the on the tops of the flowers that's a white kind of chalky stuff they are so beautiful if any of you like doing photography or art or embroidery these are the primulas to paint draw or sew. they are just beautiful absolutely beautiful and they set amazing seed as well just to mm -hmm. let you know in the autumn yeah so a quick trip out there in the autumn would be good <laughs> we'll go on to the next one as well mm -hmm. again another quick close-up i couldn't resist it because they are so beautiful yeah really really nice. They're lovely we go they are lovely and we'll go on to the next one yes so this is actually a grass verge outside uh jockey's house and um he did this without discussing it with the council <laughs> but seemingly he still hasn't been arrested and they might quite like it but look at that beautiful edging and I mean he's even given a nice grass verge that he cuts as well they really couldn't complain could they that he's planted up the grass <laughs> the grass verge amazing he's just the most one of the most amazing people ever and I just wish there were more people like Jockey because wouldn't it be fantastic if we could walk down roads and see these beautiful flower beds that mm -hmm. you know that he's put in if we all did that it would be such a lovely place yeah so we pop on to the next one pauline yeah it, it just looks so full so they are absolutely crammed completely yeah. and utterly crammed um now this picture is actually into uh the community garden which is across the road from the watering hole and um there's a kind of it's it's huge it's a beautiful grassy area and his father donated this particular field, which is on the slope, to the community. And then Jockey planted it up because he had to spare plants, obviously, from his garden and he needed somewhere to put them. So he put these um, he put these plants into the community garden. And there's a kind of a rill, which is like a, a wee kind of burn going down through the community garden. And either side, it's completely cram packed. And then at the top of the community garden, which this bit is, um, again, massively wide herbaceous borders, full of beautiful plants. Mm -hmm. If we go on to the next one, I'm hoping I put a picture in of the a bit of a more of an overview. Oh, and there's Jockey standing in the middle of the garden. <laughs> I had to put that. So he's just like, you can tell by his lovely smile. He's yeah. a lovely, lovely man. So that's the architect of the garden himself, or three gardens, in fact, or four if you can the grass verge. Um, that's <laughs> gonna uh, Giant gunner at the back there, Chilean mm. plant, John, uh, gunner manicator. We go on to the next one, Pauline. Yes. And another one. We'll go back. We'll go on to the next one. That's another piece of the herbaceous border. Um, yeah, again, there's Regersia, geranium, iris in there, more primulas. And uh, actually, that pink, pink at the back is a, a large climbing kind of geranium. Um, that looks like Smilacina in the middle there, and uh, ferns at the back as well. And I said the Regersia and the white at the top. I think that's another geranium as well mm -hmm. at the top mm -hmm. there. But they all, and you can see the old flower heads here of alliums that were um, in flower earlier, and actually Libertia as well, Libertia seed heads here too. So it all just goes beautifully to make an amazing kind of stushy of colour. It's really, really good. And it doesn't, because Jockey says he's not a gardener, he's definitely is a gardener. Yes. <laughs> he's passionate about it. He spends his whole life in the garden. Um, but, he, and he's really understated. He used to be a school teacher. That tells you everything, doesn't it? I always find school teachers make brilliant gardeners for some reason. Wow. Um, so yeah, I, but he said he had no knowledge. He just loves, he just loves gardening. So, mm -hmm. um, it goes to show what you can create. Yeah. We, we go on to the next one, Paulie. Mm, lovely. Yep, I couldn't resist that. Sorry, the colour of the Florinde. What an amazing colour. 
that is. I love it. It's absolutely beautiful. Again, actually, they make really good cut flowers as well. Mm. And they have a perfume. They smell. Um, I think they smell like lemonade. Yeah. Um, but again, on warm days, it's not every day. And they're very weather resistant. They're really good. They hold up beautifully against the, um, the rain, mm -hmm. which is really important for gardening here. Really important. Mm -hmm. And they have kind of rounded leaves. They form really big clumps and they don't have typical primula type leaves. They're very, very good. They're very tough, actually. Yeah. Do you go have on to the next garden? one, Pauline. Do you have them in your garden? Uh, we, I have. We've got a few, yes, we've got a small rill, which we plant them along um, a bit like in jockeys, actually. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, yeah, this is again, you can, well, you can't really see the rill because the plants have taken it over so much. But this is either side, the rill goes down. You can see in the distance, a bit of grass. Um, it is quite a big field. And there's a theater at the bottom that they've been, um, that's been dug into the ground. It's like a round semicircle theater with stone seats and people sit on. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've kind of jumped from, I haven't actually, I'm really stupid, I should have put one of the whole overview of the field in. Um, it's all right. Lovely. But it's open to the public. Anyone can walk in any time of the year and it is beautiful and they put performances on. Schools go there and use the theater to do outside performances. And it really is just lovely, just lovely. And you might be lucky enough to find jockey in there. You probably actually see him bent over weeding or something or planting but I'm sure you'd recognize him somehow <laughs> we've seen his picture now we know we know what he looks like can't escape yes <laughs> so that's the end of, that's the end of my second yeah, garden if there's any questions about any jockey's questions. garden I'd be very happy to um answer that any questions ladies or comments maybe you maybe you've been have you been to to Orkney and seen any of the gardens we've talked about so far No. Is it the one behind the church? Yes, oh, in Finstown. It is, yes, yeah, that's right. We were there a couple of years ago. Uh, no, just actually, uh, yeah, two years ago. Yes. Beautiful. Yeah. What time of year was it you were there? It was in summer. Yeah. I've got relatives so you... that live in Finstown, so that's why. All oh, right. Fantastic. Oh. Mm -hmm. So you know it? <laughs> Very slightly. <Yeah. laughs> right. Well, when you go back, Alistair, you must ask uh, for Jockey and ask to okay. go into his private garden okay. because he'd be delighted to show it to you. And he'll tell you the stories of his mm -hmm. family as well. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's worth going around the community garden with him too because he's mm -hmm. a wealth of knowledge and he just has the most incredible stories of old Orkney, which is mm -hmm. really lovely. So, um, so love I really quite like Finstown actually. There's some really interesting. It's a lovely leaves. place, yeah. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. And also, there used to be the Judith Glue shop there too, didn't there? You know, yeah. Judith there's Glue. There's there. there's one there. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There was for a while. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. still there, but it's well worth going to see. I know there's one in Kirkwall. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's great, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's a great shop. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alison. Uh, Leslie, you've got a question. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Yeah, yeah, great. You're very good at unmuting. Oh, yeah. I was looking up those lovely geraniums. Did, did they die off every winter and then need to be cut back? And... They do. It's like, I love that garden, but that looks like a nest an awful lot of work. <laughs> yes. It, yeah, I think it is. I think it's a lot of work. He does get help from volunteers he asks for volunteers and quite often I think some families come and help him um but I suspect what we've started to do and I'm sure Jockey must do this himself now we tend to not clear our garden until um well we've only just cleared our herbaceous actually in March we leave it because we think it actually is better to do that because it protects the plants and the roots from any bad frosts or any cold or anything and also it's quite good for insects and moths and things like that and then we just clear it and when you clear it in March it just pulls away really easily so you can almost rake it off gently and um, it comes away much more easily but you're right actually I think the thing that makes it quite a lot of work for jockey is the fact it's really a lot of space there's a lot of planting you know that reel is really long um, and it's absolutely solid Mm. really really amazing 
Yeah. It can't be in there. Oh, my father just knew that way. The end of mine means, but trying to get in and get past the brambles and the gallons <laughs> for the last year and the plants that I want to have. Um, and I've got lots of, I'm the same, I'll leave it until March. That's me being working on it the last month. <clears throat> and I'm still no bottom do yet. And I've, I've got stuff that I can reach. It's all within kind of six feet. Yeah. And that looks like 12, 20 feet. And how do you get yeah. to and how do you get good there? I think you must have a technique. Normally, if I work in a really broad bed, I look to, to a spot that I can stand on and then I work within arm's reach, 360 degrees around me. Yeah. And then I'll step out and move back. It really gets you fit, good for yoga. It's, you, you don't need to do any yoga, basically. Um, but there, I think there is definitely a technique and you kind of, after a few years, you get to know the bits you can actually stand in safely without doing too much damage. And if you do happen to stand on one, generally speaking, they cope because they're herbaceous. So they come back up again. So um, yeah, it is, it is a knack. And as I say, I think he's very fit for his age and he's very bendy and supple. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've fallen over a few times in my flower bed, just trying to balance on tiptoes to not stand on things and stuff. And it doesn't really work. I end up flat on my face quite often. So uh, <laughs> not I so good. I the gardening, sitting on my backside, doing that 360 thing. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds great. I like that idea. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you, you Leslie. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Um, Alex Eaton, I'm going to come to you now, Alex. Hello, Alex. Hello there. Hi. Hi. Are you getting me? Yes. yes. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Two, two quick issues. Hi, Sue. I'm in our pool. Ah, hello, Alex. <laughs> hey, Alex. I thought I recognised you. Um, right. Yes. I know. I I know all about your setup, of course, and how wonderful it is. Oh. But there were just two things you were talking about. You know, the importance of le leaving clearing until quite late. Oh. Now it's quite interesting because I went out to start just tidying up just a couple of weeks ago and just completely randomly heard, I think it was probably on the radio, leave it until it's consistently about 10 degrees. Because, I mean, we, we haven't a hope yet, obviously this year, no. but you know, they reckon that anything below 10 degrees and you're going to compromise the wee beasties. But, you know, obviously that's a bit impractical this year, but I was quite interested to hear that. I didn't realize yeah. it had to be quite so mild, you know? Mm -hmm. It is actually, you know, that's a really interesting thing, Alex, because they're right and yes and no. In Scotland, well, actually, I think probably anywhere in the UK at the moment, it's really difficult to do that in practice. Also, yeah. not only that, because it, um, at this time of year, we've got shoots coming up and in March, shoots started mm -hmm. to come up. If you leave the dead on the top, it does protect them if you do have a yes. really late frost but it's kind of a, a gamble between taking your shoots off when you take the dead off so it's difficult now I do I do moth um I catch moths you know I, trapping moth trapping I release them immediately after I've looked at them and I do recording of moths now moths obviously need to live in the leaf litter so I'm really concerned about that I'm kind of quite worried about that too again I've got to wait until well, probably six degrees is when they start coming out. But they're absolutely right that moths are quite canny. They don't emerge until it's been consecutively warm for quite a few days. Mm -hmm. So I think really, if you can leave it as late as possible to rake off your dead herbaceous, I think it does benefit the plants and the insects. But 10 degrees for us, We'd be yes. waiting till July, wouldn't we, really? Yeah. I was thinking that, you know, but it was funny, you know, that two two mornings ago, we had quite a bit of snow and three mornings ago, and I was standing on the snow, pegging the washing out, and this massive bumblebee went past me, and I oh. thought, what's wow. going on here, you know? <laughs> because Wonderful. it was so cold, wasn't it, with that snow? It was anyway, really cold, hopefully, really cold. Hopefully yeah. it's going to warm up a bit. But the other was... issue, sorry? Yes. No, no, no. <laughs> The other issue I was going to ask you about, just quickly, going back to peonies, I have got, it's, I suppose, I don't know whether it's a peony rose or what it is, but it's quite a large shrub with very, very woody, tough stems. Um, I think last year it got to standing over three feet high. I'm told it is a peony and it's got a lovely little yellow, yeah, yellow yeah. flower with a lovely scarlet inside, but all the flowers 
are within the leaf structure. So you have to actually part the leaves to be able to see them. Mm. Now, is that what do you, is that you're familiar with those? Obviously? I am. Yes, yes. We used to have that at Inview, and um, I'm. It's a tree. It's a form of a tree peony. It's a kind of a, it's a hardy type peony, and um, it is in fact it's a native peony that it, not native to Scotland, obviously. Mm. Uh, it's a species peony. That's the way I should probably say it, rather than um, a cultivated one. And species do tend to have slightly smaller flowers and have sometimes these issues with the foliage coming up around them. Um, there's not much you can do about it apart from just enjoy it. And actually, if you really want to, you can snip off a few leaves around. Oh, that's so, good. Because I just yeah. felt, you know, I mean, last year, as we all know, was just so spectacular. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I felt it's right beside the front door, it's taking far too much space and all this abundance of green with all these little flowers absolutely lost to everybody. But that's a good tip. I'll, I'll try yeah. that this we, year. We I'll that. make them a little bit more visible. Thank you very much. Lovely to speak to you soon. You're Thank welcome, you. Alex. Bye-bye <laughs> for now. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. So we'll go back to the pictures, Sue. Yeah, I think we'll. Yeah, that's just... great. Yeah. Well, hang on one sec. I'll just get myself organized. Uh... Share screen. Okay. So I'm just going to very quickly tell you you may have heard on television, and actually, if you any of you watched Neil Oliver recently, this is called the Ness of Brogda, which is a new massive piece of archaeology that was uncovered uh, quite, uh, just a few years ago. And um, it's thought basically to be a massive ceremonial site. And they open it up for six weeks of the year in July. And they have everybody, all these archaeologists, come and descend upon the Ness of Brogda. And the field has been given by the farmer actually to the archaeologists and it's going to be an ongoing project and they have found the most amazing things. So there's basically more than one layer of civilization. There's Neolithic and Mesolithic, which is older than 5,000 years old. And they found um, evidence of Mesolithic in a tiny piece of wood. And I was really lucky to be there about the day or week after they found this piece of wood with the group. And we got taken into the below the ropes and we were allowed to go and talk to the archaeologists and stuff and I was holding this piece of wood and Nick Card actually if we go on to the next photograph Pauline yes Nick Card he looks like Indiana Jones doesn't he <laughs> um he's really amazing archaeologist there's nothing this guy doesn't know about ancient history he handed the piece of wood to me and he said oh I just had Neil Oliver here yesterday and um, he was holding the same piece of wood. I didn't wash my hands for a week. <laughs> anyway, I was so delighted. And then the program has been on television quite a bit, but it is the most astounding place. You can see in the background, there's a piece of green netting that's actually scaffolding that you can just drive along. You can park up and you can stand on the scaffolding and watch the archeologists uncover um, ancient bits of history. It's absolutely fantastic. And it's right in between the nests of, um, the Stones of Stennis and um, the Ring of Brogda, the two standing circle stones. Mm. Um, really incredible. And interestingly, they're all on the same ley lines as Maze Howe, the burial mound, and Scarabray. So they were all connected by these ancient bypaths and routes and things. Really fascinating. Anyway, I had to put the Ness of Brogda in because it is Orkney. This is on Orkney mainland. So we go on to the next um, picture, please, Pauline. And there we have the stones of Stennis. Mm -hmm. I think that's the door. I think those two stones are speaking to each other. Apparently these are, are aligned um, with the Offa mountains and the moon setting. I think it's in the midwinter solstice and the moon sets beyond the Offia mountains. It kind of sets, if you stand, you can see it setting between these two stones, which are um, quite amazing, mm -hmm. really beautiful. Mm -hmm. So we go on to the next photograph, please, Pauline. Mm -hmm. And this is by the car park. When you pull up and you walk to the uh, stones, this is Villa Pendula and how magnificent it is. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, it's actually quite stunted because it is really, really open, just beautiful, nothing but water, short grass, lap wings, um, amazing bird life and these beautiful, beautiful flowers. 
And the air that is like an amazing perfume, if you know what philopendula smells like, I quite like it. Mm -hmm. uh, some people say it smells a bit like cat pee, but I quite like it. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not cat pee. <laughs> anyway, so that, that's a philopendula, that's wild, just growing wild. Can we go on to the next photograph, Pauline? Mm -hmm. And this is my personal favorite wildflower, Ragged Robin. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, I can't tell you my joy and delight when I found it growing wild with cotton grass bits in between it. And this was right next to the philopendula, right by the car park for the, the standing stones. How fantastic is that? And there's a piece of plantain, those funny seed pod thingies sticking up, that's the flowers of plantain. Or oh, no, it's not, actually, no, that's mare's tail. It's, okay. um, oh, yeah, yeah. you can see it there, yeah, you yeah. can see it there. So we go on to the next, I had to put a few wildflowers in, into the next one. Oh, and yes, my favorite, another favorite bog of cotton yeah. grass, which I just couldn't resist putting in. So these, if you go to Orkney, please just really enjoy the wild scenery because there's a much, as much joy to be taken from the um, beautiful countryside and the roadside verges and the fields as there is the gardens too. Of course, I'm, I know you're going to go to Orkney for other reasons, but the gardens and the road verges are really important. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah. we go on to the next one, Pauline. Yeah. And Kirkwall, this is St Magnus Cathedral. I just wanted to put this in to show you actually complete contrast, obviously from the Ness of Brogda to this absolutely beautiful red sandstone cathedral. Again, you can go in it any time of day or night and it's magnificent and the history, I mean, I could probably give a whole nother talk on the history of, the, of this cathedral. It's absolutely beautiful. And there's someone's head buried, there's St. Magnus's head buried apparently in one of the pillars in the, in the cathedral, mm -hmm. just to add a, a, def, um, a bit of horror there. But yeah. it is a really stunning, stunning cathedral. Um, and Kirkwall, yes, you, if, you, if you stay there, a visit to Kirkwood, you have to earn Stromness as well, of course. Fantastic coffee shops, amazing um, art galleries, really lovely knitting shops, Judith Glue shops, art shops. There's the museum as well with Tankerness uh, Garden in it too. Just incredible, just incredible place to visit. We nip onto the next one, Pauline. Yes. Very quickly, this is the Bishop's Palace uh, with St Magnus Cathedral Spire in the background. Um, again, the, uh, the history is incredible and I just had to put that in because I really like that picture mm -hmm. um, just to show sort of different, different things you can do and see when you go to Orkney, it's great. We go on to the next one, Paulie. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. And look at this, isn't that just magnificent? So we're now um, on, still on Orkney mainland. Most of all of these places are actually on Orkney ma mainland. I have been to the islands and there are gardens on the islands. This is in a place called Offair. This is um, Caroline and Kevin Critchlow's garden. And they are another lovely, lovely couple. Now, Caroline is basically, um, what is she? Miss Orkney, basically, or Queen of Orkney, we call her. And she organizes most incredible garden events. And before COVID happened, she was organizing garden festivals every year, three day garden festivals and plant fairs on Orkney. Her husband um, very sadly had um, a cerebral brain um, issue and had to have serious brain operations in hospital. So she's always fundraising for um, this incredible piece of machinery that uh, looks after people with this particular condition. Mm -hmm. And um, she's an absolute two to four. She's the most remarkable woman. But this rill was built by Kevin, her husband, and before it was full of stones, fishes and plants, Caroline used to swim in that. Wow. And it's a bit like an infinity pool. But mm. look at that. Isn't that beautiful? That's the sea beyond. And um, her garden is immaculate. Very sadly, I will have to just mention this, though. Um, because of COVID and various things to do with their business, um, they were forced to sell their house and garden this mm. last year. And they've moved into, a, they own a holiday accommodation next door, which has also got a beautiful garden. Mm -hmm. So they've moved into that and they've sold it. But apparently the new people that have bought this garden and the house are really lovely. 
and they're going to be opening this garden again uh, by appointment and on Scotland's garden scheme. Okay. So I'm still hoping we'll be able to go and see it. And of course, then it's going to be even better because Caroline will be developing even a more beautiful yeah. garden next door. So we'll have two gardens to see, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. So we go on to the next photograph. That's lovely. And that's a, just a quick close up. That also was built by her husband, Kevin. How clever is he? Yeah. He's amazing. Um, it's just a really nice shape. I love that. And by those gates. Um, and there's been another piece of art actually put into the garden, which are these beautiful wrought iron gates that she had des um, designed. I forgot to mention the name of the, of the garden. It's called the, the Koi of Hooton. I'll spell it afterwards. And um, we go on to the next photo, mm -hmm. Pauline. Yeah. And this is just standing at the side of her garden, looking across at the sea. Look at the turquoises in the sea. Mm. And these wildflowers are just magnificent. It's mostly buttercups and clover and just unbelievable ragged robin in there, of course. And actually, if you look into the distance, you can see on the horizon, on the grassy bit, those are actually pillboxes. They're from the Second World War because you know that Scatter Flow and the Orkney Islands are very important um strategically to the military and of course it's very close to um oh the churchill barriers and where all the ships um submarines were kept out and the ships came in for safe anchorage um and that's another whole history lesson in itself but um yes this is orkney to me this epitomizes orkney beautiful pale blue sky fluffy clouds wild flowers and that incredible see those beautiful shades so really i think orkney is just one big garden actually it is yeah. absolutely beautiful mm -hmm. we go on to the next one yes. Pauline. and so that's looking at uh from the other end uh that's caroline's house just there and the garden goes either side and round the back a wee bit as well she grows vegetables etc too um and it, I just think it actually really frames the garden and the house absolutely beautiful. It is, it is, it's really, really lovely. Lovely. I still think I'd probably want to swim with the fish somehow looking at that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we nip on to the next one. I'm just concerned about my timing. That's fine. Oh, that's absolutely beautiful. This is called um, Pearl Dropwort and it's a native plant. And in fact, this was along the bottom of Caroline's wall and it's uh, deadly poisonous, um, really deadly poisonous, but nonetheless, it is so beautiful. Um, and just this lime green, it just looks really lovely against the blue, blue sky. In fact, I think it's a really garden worthy plant. It's wild and it's native, but I think I'd actually put that into my garden, um, mm. but keep cows and children away from it, definitely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're nip on to the next. Yes. So this is Caroline's herbaceous border. And in fact, what we're looking at in the front here is Napita, probably six hills giant with um, oh, uh, Al Camilla Mollus in the background and uh, geraniums again. Yes, Orkney and geraniums, it was a grower of geraniums on Aquilegia um, and Anaphilus. And that looks like, um, actually, that looks like small Sambucus there, purple Sambucus. There was a, um, a gentleman whose name totally escapes me. He was a famous breeder of geraniums, Orkney geraniums. There were small ones, though, not the large ones. Um, he had a nursery and his geraniums are now sold worldwide. And sadly, I think he stopped breeding them because but he was absolutely exceptional. There was one called Orkney Cherry, which is absolutely delightful, but it, I'm guessing he bred them and um, made good money at, uh, I, would, I would hope anyway he did, at breeding them. And the fact that people and massive plant companies have bought the rights to his geraniums is because they grow so well on Orkney, they really do. Mm -hmm. And with that in mind, they grow really well here in Scotland in, on the mainland as well. We've got quite a good collection of um, geraniums in our garden too. Mm -hmm. So we nip on to the next yes. photograph, Pauline. And there we have Sambucus black lace. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love 
this. So this is elderflower, cut leaf elderflower, purple foliage, and uh, the flowers are pink. And yes, if you make elderflower champagne or elderflower cordial with the flowers, you get pink elderflower champagne. Ooh, exciting. I think that's fantastic, <laughs> don't you? I think it's amazing. But that foliage is black as black. It's so beautiful. And the best thing to do with this is they tend to grow quite leggy is to cut them back every so often. So you have them bushy as a kind of a really nice plant foil for the rest of your plants. And you, I would grow them in herbaceous borders too, at the back. Um, and they really show up incredibly other bright colors. You see, I would put bright orange against that, yeah. but I'm a bit of a heathen when it comes to colors. I love bright, bright colors and big contrast. So, mm -hmm. well, so that's, um, that's fantastic. Yeah. So um, yeah, we'll go on to the next one. Okay, so we're near the end. And this is the Italian chapel. I may have mentioned this to you. This is on the Churchill Barriers, actually. Um, I, I'm sure most of you probably know the history about the Italian chapel. I, in the Second World War, prisoners of war, Italian prisoners of war were kept on Orkney and they were put to work building the Churchill Barriers to prevent um, German U-boats coming in. And in the meantime, this actually behind this facade here, is there's a Nissan hut and these incredibly innovative Italians, they were very homesick. They froze their butts off too, um, coming from a hot country mm. and they were Catholic. And so they had nowhere to uh, preach. What I loved was actually the um, Orcadian people knitted them jumpers. Mm. And there's some fantastic photographs of these big old, huge baggy old jumpers on these little tiny Italian men. I think they were very grateful and they wore shorts. Can you believe that? They turned up with shorts. They were captured in the desert apparently and brought with just shorts on oh. to Orkney. A bit cruel really, isn't it? Anyway, the inside of the chapel is painted. Um, I'm just trying to remember the name. I should have remembered, I should have written his name down. This Italian um, gentleman was a, an amazing artist and the whole of the inside has been concreted over and beautifully painted amazing amazing paintings a bit like the Sistine Chapel and they were very clever because they used bits of old Land Rover to make a font and they used old um, corned beef meat tins to turn cut holes in made these absolutely beautiful ornate lanterns to hang up in there and the whole of the um, oh my goodness I've forgotten the name the grill the rails at the front were made out of twisted rebars so everything was basically filched and pilfered from the Churchill barriers, the large bits of concrete, the metal and stuff. And they just nicked bits that were being discarded and built this beautiful chapel. The whole of the front of this has been cast by them too. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the bell was sent from Italy. And since then the families have come back in 1980s and the gentleman that did the painting repainted the ceiling and touched it up mm -hmm. and obviously the Italians married into certain Orcadian families so there's this incredibly close-knit com um, community yeah. but again if you go to Orkney the, the chapel is an absolute must so I'll stop talking about it now because um, I think probably my time's up well, and last, last lovely picture. this is my final so uh, final photograph to say goodbye this is the sunset um actually just on the harbour at Kirkwall this is where you would catch your boats to go out to the islands and most evenings I've been there there's been this spectacular sunset so I just had to put that in yeah so I'm just going to be quiet now and ask if there's any questions that was lovely Sue well done well done Let's um let's see see if we get any questions. You can all unmute now if you want to, ladies, and then and we can, you can all just um let me know if you have a question. Shout, shout Paul and let me find you before um before you start you start asking your question. No, that's just so I can make sure everybody can see who's asking. Yeah. So um so who 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 wants to go to Orkney straight away now? they were lovely they were lovely yes does anyone grow geraniums in their garden yes mm -hmm. uh, yes mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. yes. Uh, do you have the 
But what the what are the name? What's the name of the um the special ones, Sue? That you the the sorry the geraniums? Did you yeah. say? Yeah. Or the, um, no, the primulas. Well, sorry, the primulas with the, the primulas the, 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 yeah. the tall yeah. candelabra primulas yeah. with Florinde. Yes, they they're the beautiful tall ones. I just saw someone flash up. Did I um see the Scottish primula primula scotica? Yes, I have. Um, there's um yes, Nabi head. You can see it. I have seen primula scotica, which is tiny in comparison to the tall Florinde ones. Primula scotica is a tiny little rosette, miniature. It's about the size of a ten p piece with flower spikes about, a, well, anything from a centimeter to an inch tall with the brightest vermilion pink, tiny little miniature primula flowers. Oh. You can see them in Caithness as well on Duncansby and Donut Head as well. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Thank you. Lovely. Mm. Have we got any questions about, about Orkney or anything? Oh, Janet, mm. I can see your hand up and I'll come to Christine after I've gone to Janet, okay? Hello, Janet. Hello, Janet. Oh, I can't um, hear you. Janet, we can't hear you. Right, you're on mute, but yeah. we can't hear you. I'm going to mute you and then ask you to unmute and see if that helps. <clears throat> so, you need to do it again. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Janet. Yeah. Try it now. Yeah, we still can't hear you. Yeah, that's it. Sometimes when you have, have headphones in, uh, your your machine, it sometimes doesn't let you speak. Maybe that was what it was. Well, I've got extra um, speakers on, so I've taken the extra speakers off. I'm just yeah, on the... Yeah, that's it. Yeah, great. Questions about the delphiniums. I've got several in my garden, and at the moment they're about a foot high and very bushy. Should I be thinning them out so that the stronger spikes will produce strong flowers or not? Um, it, I personally, I wouldn't. I think I'm very jealous of the fact you've got bushy kelp in here. <laughs> <laughs> I would, no, I, um, where else do you live, Janet? We're in England, in Derbyshire, right in the middle of uh, the peak, near the Peak District. Fantastic. Okay, well, in that case, um, because you're not living in Scotland, I, you could probably choose to do that and then you would definitely, yes, if you have a strong, one particular strong one, yes, and you find that you can grow delphiniums really easily and really, um, they grow really beautifully for you, you most certainly can do that. Um, and interestingly, I suspect where you live, you would be able to get a second flowering as well. So when your delphinium has finished flowering, cut it back and yeah. you'll probably get some more coming up too. So yes, certainly. Right, they're my favourites, we grow them every year. Now, regarding slugs, um, what we do is, January and February, we get sharp sand and put sharp sand all the way around the bottom. It seems to keep the slugs. That's, the question, mm -hmm. That's fantastic, Janet, thank you. That's a good tip, sharp sand. <laughs> right, I'm going to try that. Okay. It'll, be, it'll, be nice, it'll be nicer for the slugs, Janet. They won't be exploding all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you never do it, as soon as the new shoes come through, they eat the new shoes. The Alphiniums just do not flourish that year. Yeah. Yeah, they're a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, Janet. Janet. And nice to see you again. I've seen you before, haven't I? So nice to see you again. Um, great, great. Um, now I'm looking for Christine. Yeah, Christine, you were you had a question too? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, can I just say how much I've enjoyed it? I love Primula, particularly mm -hmm. the, the Candelabras. But my question is about your Zambucus. What time of year would you be uh, would you be cutting it back, and how each year or how many years in between your your pruning? Um, I think it depends again where you live and how quickly and bushy it grows. Because if you live in a really exposed area, what you might find is it's retarded naturally by the wind um, or by the cold. So you may not need to cut it back quite so often. Um, but generally speaking, if it's, I mean, I've had, I've lived in Sussex and it's grown really lush and I, I have to cut it back every single year. Um, 
It depends. If you're not too fussed about um, getting the berries, I mean, quite often those ornamental sambucus don't actually produce huge racemes of berries anyway. They have really sparse ones. Um, you can almost cut the sambucus, it's so tough, you can almost cut it back at any time. But probably, um, I would probably cut it back in the autumn um, when it's finished, you know, when the leaves are about coming off it. I'd cut it back and um, then in the springtime, you'll have these really lovely yeah. new lush stems coming up yeah. and hopefully setting flower. But sometimes they are saying that, in fact, I've cut mine back and then I've noticed I've actually missed out flowers the next year. So, um, yes, I think it really depends on where you live. I would say when you cut it back, cut it back down hard enough, you can cut them back to about a foot to the ground and then you won't have to cut it back every year and then you'll be sure not to lose the flowers if you know what I mean um, for quite a few years and you'll keep the flowers hopefully. That sounds good thank you very much. Okay Christine. Thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much Christine thank you and um, we've got any other questions or on uh, on Orkney or on uh, flowers in general remember we don't we're going to we're going to lose Sue for a few months, so we need to we need to get what's in our brain out before she before she disappears to, to do our normal normal jobs. <laughs> before I go and wage war on slugs. <laughs> before, before she goes out with a bran. <laughs> uh, okay, I don't I don't. It doesn't look like we've got we've got questions then. So what I'm going to do now, girls, is just say um, let's give Sue a big round of applause and say thank you so much, Sue. Not not thank just you. for this talk, but for the other talks that you've done. And, um, and yeah. if, if anyone has if anyone has missed any, yeah. thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you all thank of you. Thank you. Such a lovely audience thank as you. well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. And hopefully, I look forward to seeing you again, maybe in the autumn. And um, Good. I think some other either really beautiful places to show you, or maybe even just do topical gardening uh, talks about making compost and making wine. <laughs> <laughs> That'll go down well, Sue. That'll go down well. <laughs> now, if, any, if anyone has missed any of the pre previous talks that Sue has done, they're, they're on the, the YouTube channel. Which is called Scottish Women's Institutes TV, so you can just go there and and you'll find um, Sue's talk and and a lot more other other talks as well and and uh, Skillshare sessions. So um, they're they're um, they're open for everyone. Um, and Sue, we wish you all the best for the for the spring and summer. Yeah. First, yeah. first lambing and then and then slugging and then uh, <laughs> and gardening. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Pauline. Yes. Thank you. And I hope to see some of you as well, perhaps, yes. over the next yes. year. Mm -hmm. Let's hope so. That would yes. be so nice, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. That would be lovely. Yeah. Lovely. Well, thank, thank you all you. very much, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.